call, please, Mr. Lewis. Mrs. Cybulski? Here. Mrs. Craig? Here. Mrs. Milliken Dixon? Here. Mrs. Ortiz? Present. And Mr. Pearson? Here. Are we in compliance, Mr. Yes. Lewis? Yes, we are. This meeting is a meeting of the Board of Education in public for the purpose of conducting the school district's business and is not to be considered a public community meeting. There is a time for public participation during the meeting as indicated in the agenda. If you're able, please rise us for the pledge, join us, rise for the pleasant, uh, pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, Motion to approve last month's minutes, please. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed correspondence. Any correspondence? No. Then I would like to get a motion for approval of the minutes. <coughs> Moved. Second. <coughs> Any discussion? Okay, roll call, please. Mrs. Cybalski? Yes. Mrs. Craig? Yes. Milliken Dixon? Yes. Mrs. Ortiz? Yes. And Mr. Pearson? Yes. Treasurer's financial report, Mr. Lilly? So moved. Second? Second. Any discussion? Is there anything to share with us about this? Not a thing. No. All right. Roll call, please. Mrs. Craig? Yes. Mrs. Milliken Dixon? Yes. Mrs. Ortiz? Yes. Mr. Pearson? Yes. And Mrs. Seibel? Yes. Informational items. Mr. Lilly, you want to tell us what uh, uh, we have the investments? What am I doing going ahead? I apologize. We need to approve the invoices. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Any discussion? No informational items. Uh, roll, call. roll call. Oh, my gosh. I apologize, you guys. Mrs. Milliken Dixon? <sighs> yes. Mrs. Ortiz? Yes. Mr. Pearson? Yes. Mrs. Cybalski? Yes. And Mrs. Craig? Yes. Can I give it a third try? Okay. Informational okay. items? Okay. <laughs> we have some donations, and some of these donations will be addressed on another item to establish a fund. <coughs> uh, $500 from the American Red Cross for a scholar scholarship. $500 from the Ohio Association of School Business Officials for a scholarship, and $2,000 um, from Schwab Charitable for the Mark Ray Sarah Ann Scholarship. Now, these scholarships were already awarded in May at the Scholarship Awards Assembly, mm -hmm. but there was some uh, change from both the Red Cross and Schwab Charitable that these used to be, or, or the intention was that they were going to be direct, like most of our scholarships, right. direct to the uh, scholarship the Red Cross has always done it that way, but for some reason now is sending the checks to the school district. So because of that, later on you'll see we have to establish a scholarship fund for each of these, and then we can pay out to the uh, scholarship recipients. Uh, we also had, uh, and you may have seen it in the newspaper, the uh, high school art department had won uh, a mural contest. They mm -hmm. painted a beautiful mural on the El Cibillo American Legion post and they received $2,500 in donations for that work mm -hmm. uh, that they can use in the art department. Very nice. Any questions, comments? Roll call, please. A motion, please. No. No? Roll call. I'm sorry. Legislative report. Please. Uh, pretty boring on my end. I started to type this up about a week ago and waited to see if there was anything more interesting in the House bill and the <laughs> floor, but... Uh, so far, n not going to go my way. Uh, there was, um, we had House Bill 468. Uh, basically, this is just, it allows a federally recognized patriotic program. Think of things that we've already had implemented here, kind of like the Voice of America contests, things that the Eagles uh, and our VFW chapters put on. And then they just added on top of having a liaison between a student body and one of those entities that we want whoever comes to the school to present usually around once per year to have a criminal background check in line with our BCI policies we already have in our bylaws. So that's really <coughs> all we have introduced. Uh, that hearing was on, I believe, the 4th of June, and, and that's really all I have. Um, so
since our major update in April. So uh, I'll keep an eye on this. The education uh, committee is now in, in session a lot more often than it has been this past month and a half. Uh, so we'll probably have a larger update once more. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <coughs> A tech report, please, Mrs. Ortiz. Uh, yes, we met um, earlier today. Um, some just general administrative um, contracts to um, approve the construction process or progress is on track, and they're finishing up the repairs to part of the roof. And it was pretty quiet today. So. Thank you. Report of the substitute superintendent. Mr. Riley. Thank you. We have a, a couple of, couple of uh, presentations, short presentations this evening. Um, first off, we're going to have representatives from Northeast Communications Security, along with Mr. Marker John, come down and talk about the um, <coughs> large radio project that we've undertaken. Mr. Marker John, would you like to come down and, and start explaining where we're at, the history of this, and then we'll have uh, the representatives kind of come forward and talk about it. Could you hear me, Mr. Hayes? We can always hear you, Mr. Marker John. <laughs> Let's try that. So this, our radios, first of all, we have always used VHF radios for our buses. Um, about almost 20 years ago, we got radios for our buildings so we could go ahead and communicate within our buildings. It was a form of safety and a form of convenience for us. They were UHF radios, so there was a nice big VHF radio for the buses and a nice big UHF radio for us to be able to communicate within the buildings. Um, but as we worked on increasing our communication abilities, we worked on improving our safety in the district. Uh, these became more limited and much more difficult for us to be able to communicate. So Mr. Bergard and myself, almost two years ago, started to look for a solution that we could go ahead and have some main pieces to this. One radio to communicate within our buildings that would also communicate with our buses. And an additional piece of being able to communicate building to building in an emergency. So if I felt the need to go ahead and pull up the walkie talkie and talk to Mrs. Brzenko at her building, I could go ahead and do that. So we took a long time vetting and we came up with three local companies that made proposals and Mr. Bergard and these companies ran tests on their effectiveness and we were able to go ahead and figure out where we had some issues and what worked and based on how that came out and with a very competitive price, we were able to go ahead and add additional radios and still come underneath what our original budget that we needed to go ahead and hit. Um, so we are going to drastically increase the number of radios that we have. So these two fine gentlemen from Northeast Communications are gonna go ahead and explain, but these will be new radios for our buses, base units in our offices, and radios for each one of our buildings, bus garage, maintenance department, and um, our, our central office, our, our board office. Uh, so everybody will be able to communicate with these same radios within the buildings, building to building, and building to bus. Jeez, take half of this bill. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. I'm uh, John Ricky. I'm the president of Northeastern Communications. Uh, we're out of Ashtabula. We've been doing uh, most of your radio work for about 30 years. Um, uh, this system will uh, be digital instead of analog. And like they explained, everything will be UHF. It'll be on the same frequency. And each building will have a repeater in it. And each repeater will be linked through the IP through your wide area network so that you could be in, in the Cork and you can actually go to a channel and talk to somebody at the high school. And it's called um, group calling. And uh, you'll also be able, oops, excuse me. Um, so each building will have, and the repeater will have two talk paths. And uh, the first talk path will be building the building, and the second uh, talk path will be just bus. So you'll be with a handheld radio, you'll be able to talk to the bus with a from anywhere in the district. And um, that's about all I have. <laughs> Do you have any questions? So we're no longer going to, we're going to, we don't have to rely on cell service? No. no. This is totally its own thing. Its own thing. It's a, a system. It's digital. Is the latency far superior as well since it uses IP over radio frequency? Yeah, the, the, the latency is almost non-existent. And so with security, that also increases because it's going through a WAN as opposed to a radio frequency? Yeah, the, well, the buildings are linked all through the WAN. Yes. Perfect. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. still have 57 minutes. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, a repeater will be on each one of the buildings. Oh, do they look cool? Oh, uh, yeah, they're very... <laughs> If you're a radio guy, they're great. Yeah, anybody so, else? No. Be a radio. And, there, and there's going to be a, a digital RF link between, like, the high school and a tower site. So they're redundant already. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Okay. So we've had some struggles with communicating with buses um, to parents. Okay. Right. Do you have any? And forgive me if this isn't your area. Maybe it's a question for Mr. Markajan. How's this going to improve that? How how are we going to do better? With more radios, that won't help the communicating with parents. This is, this is a phone or calling. No, but it's communicating with the buses. Well, so that if they're late mm -hmm. or whatever, parents are waiting for an hour. I was just curious if this addresses that or not. Well, the only thing that this would benefit would be the radio that the building is carrying on them is the same radio that the bus would be on. So right now. Right now, if there's a call to Ostenburg, the base unit in the office main area, that's the only thing that's catching what's, what's being said on the bus radios. Now, all of our radios will be able to hear the bus if they have a question, oh, issue, okay. if, if, if there was a problem that occurred, we would immediately know in our offices or in our buildings and then could go ahead and communicate Take that control. and direct that to whatever parents would need to know. So it will help. Or it can it's well, it's it's it can can it's well, it's it's instant communication. Please, so. right? Right? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Is it? Oh, I'm sorry. Are you sure? Is there going to be any training that the staff has to have to use this effectively, or what does that look like? Yes, they'll have to have some training, and okay. we'll come in and go over, and we'll also make some uh, handouts. Also. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Thank you. And, and the radios will also have a display, so oh, good. You, you'll know exactly what channel you're on. And, and the, um, we're proposing that uh, Channel 4 is like the all building priority uh, for like emergencies. If you want to talk to, if you want to make sure everybody's aware, we're, we're proposing to put a blank channel between there uh, so that they actually know just that they're on that channel. You won't just be, if you're one channel off, you will not be transmitting on the radio, be giving like a beeping noise. So during an emergency, they'll really know where they're at. When we have, we have, sporting events at Spire. Mm -hmm. Would this be something that we would be able to use? It would be a school event, but not necessarily on one of our building sites. Is mm -hmm. that also applicable? Hmm. Well, the tower site is, is is that way. Okay. You have a very good coverage out that way also. Wonderful. Okay, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Just because I'm a little bit of a nerd and this is being recorded for the public, I have some, some questions I know the answers to, but I, I wanted to explain <laughs> it because I think it answers what Rock um, will take your Mrs. Dixon. 
if, if this operates on radio frequency as well as this instant IP, mm -hmm. does that indicate it has multi-band like 2.45 plus an IP antenna inside of it? No, no, no. No, there's no there's no IP on the actual radio itself. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So so it so it has a far greater Oh yeah, yeah, it, okay. it's a far greater range. And um, because of the newer models it'll have a much further range than our current radios. That that's correct because So right, then it should communicate with buses much further on because the way that that bandwidth has integrity for large expanse is almost similarly to a, a ham but more than a UHF VHF. It should reach to your point, those buses, right, and, so and that'll be something that we can take a look at as we go and communicate with you if there are any issues. Oh, sure. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. The nice thing about this is not only is going to use the tower to be able to communicate to that broad area, but the repeaters on each one of the buildings will help boost that out as our, as you know, our vast district that we have. So that will allow us to go ahead and have that communication between buildings and we have and be able to use the tower in addition to that. So that that's one of the features that they were able to offer in our proposal. Yeah, so yeah, Thank you for looking into this, guys. Yeah, it'll it'll go straight from your handheld to the repeater and through the IP link all the way out to the tower site. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yep. since you're here, I just wanted to check something with you. We re recently moved our board office. Mm -hmm. So we have a base radio there that now needs to be moved from 135 South Eagle Street to 1301 mm -hmm. Sweet A uh, South Ridge East Street by sure. high school. Um, has anybody from the district contacted you to help with that okay. move? Okay. Does it, doesn't it usually require some filing with the FCC? <laughs> well, we talked some time ago before we actually moved, and now yeah. that we moved, I'm just hoping it was, Yes, for the most part. Moving, yes. Yeah, so if you can work with Mr. Ola, Mr. Bagar, Mr. Mark, and John to get that it won't, base moved. Because we'll be moving to the, to the UHF, yeah. That'd be yeah. great. Okay. What is the timeline? Okay. Well, oh. <laughs> okay. Look at me with the good questions. <laughs> the good news is the hardware is, we're not, there's no problems with the hardware. We had issues, there was hardware issues all of 2022 and half of 2023. Mm -hmm. um, we had to deal with the FCC for the licensing. And we also have to deal with the Canadian government because we're uh, south of Line A, or north of Line A. What's so line A? It's, a, it's a It's line. like the erosion control line that runs through my yard. It's, it's yeah. yeah. Invisible it's, line in the sand. Somewhere north of Mosquito Reservoir, and it goes mm -hmm. east, and it goes halfway up Michigan, and then it goes all the way across until you get to Cal or Washington State. It's, it has to do with the Canadian. There's a, a mutual agreement between the United mm -hmm. States and Canada. So... We have to, it has to be approved by the FCC, then it goes to the Canadian version of the FCC, and then, and then it comes back to us. And we're a minimum of six months, and as high as nine months. Yeah, because we just did a, a license, some UHF repeat repairs, and that took seven months, six and a half months. Yeah. Yeah, I just. Okay. <laughs> I'm not calling you. Kevin will call you. Dan will call you. Yeah, we check on it like tw at least twice a month. So as soon as they say okay, we're okay. Oh yeah, yeah. Once it goes through, it. then yeah, just uh, just a uh, procedure. Yeah, if thing. you ever visit Geneva on the Lake, turn off roaming because <laughs> you'll get charged to Canada. It's not oh, fun. sure. Yeah, we're we're going all the way to all new licensing. Very nice. It's tough to find good help. <laughs> Anything else? Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, thank you. Thanks, guys. And Mr. Mark and John, and Mr. Brigard, and everybody that was involved in that process. Um, it was a lengthy one, but we are, as he, they indicated, significantly upgrading our technology with with respect to safety and communication here in the district. So, um, look forward to getting all that all in. Um, Second off here, we have Mrs. Pat, Mrs. Mrs. Papik from the Food Service. Uh, she's going to talk about the community eligibility provision. This came up at a, a board meeting a couple, a couple 
meetings, I believe, back, but uh, she's going to talk about the process and what she's been finding. Hello. Hello. Um, I am Michelle Patrick. I'm the food service director. Um, usually, from what I gather, the food service director presents at the July board meeting um, with a, you know, kind of recap of the previous year. Um, but in um, all of our work to um, get ready for applying for the community eligibility provision, Mr. Riley and Mr. Lilly thought it would be a good idea that I present at the June board meeting just to inform you and give you information, um, allow you guys to ask questions about the CEP program. So that's what we'll focus on today, but I'll be back in July. Uh, so the Community Eligibility Program Provision, or CEP, is um, the National School Lunch Program and Breakfast Program. It's, um, so it's the same under the USDA, the same as we operate right now, but it's another option that allows school districts that have an ISP of 25% or higher to offer breakfast and lunch at no cost to all enrolled students. So, Instead of us collecting meal applications and making individual determinations based on um, household income eligibility, uh, this program allows us to use the CEP um, reimbursement formula. Sorry, I'm nervous. <laughs> um, the formula is based on a percentage of students that automatically qualify for free meals under the direct certification process. So that's um, students who families who qualify for SNAP, TANF, Medicaid, um, the Medicaid free students, and um, Head Start. There are some, um, some abilities to allow us to include students that qualify as foster or um, homeless. So um, just a few bullet points for you all. Um, districts that want to apply um, for next school year have to do so by June 30th, so just a few days away. Um, once districts apply, as long as you meet that 25% um, for your ISP, then districts automatically qualify. qualify. Um, so the base year that we will be applying for is the 24-25 school year base year, and then that allows us three additional years after that, um, which would take us through the 27-28 school year. If um, for any reason the district decides, you know, year one in, we want to opt out for whatever reason, we can do that at any time. Um, if, so if uh, in our base year, in the 24-25 school year coming up, um, right now, currently in our application, we submit information about all the students who we believe qualify in our base year. The state will do an audit of those students and just make sure so that for the following three years, um, we're on track with our reporting. The um, identified student percentage, or ISP, for Geneva is 40%, um, which with their formula gives us a 64% um, student reimbursement at the free rate and the 36% reimbursement at the paid rate. They get that with a simple formula, which I'll talk about on, on the back of your sheet you have. Uh, the basic benefits of the program increase access to nutritious school meals for all students at no cost, um, increase in uh, participation, which we saw through all of the years we were receiving free meals with the COVID, um, with the COVID free meals through SSO. Um, it eliminates the household applications for students, um, so families no longer have to submit those um, for as far as administrative paperwork goes. We no longer have to process those applications. Um, and then lastly, with, uh, um, with not charging for meals, we don't have all of the negative balances. Um, to end this school year, I, we were in a ballpark of about 6,600 in negative balances. So, and that in, that, that's after we got a, a few donations. So um, it would help significantly with that. Some factors to consider um, are that to, you know, to go along with the fact that we will no longer be receiving free and reduced price meal applications. Um, households will still need assistance with school fees, so the state is recommending that um, we still distribute the household, the Ohio household income form, um, so that you know, student fees, um, other you know, academic fees can be waived um, if families qualify. 
Um, and then just something else to consider if um, participation doesn't as cre increase as we would expect it to, it could be a possible negative financial impact on our food service department. So that's something we'll be monitoring really closely. And then um, cafeteria adjustments may be needed as we go. Um, I wouldn't plan to start the school year with those adjustments just based on um, you know, wanting to spend a month or two to see, see how it goes, see what participation we, we receive. But um, if participation increases how I expect it would, we would maybe need um, some additional staffing time, 15 minutes for you know, the staff we currently have, something like that. Um, and other adjustments like line time, you know, wait times for students, that sort of thing. So those are all things we'll be monitoring closely in the first month. Okay, and then um, just on the back, I wanted to give you, I know it's small, sorry, <laughs> um, but I just printed out the USDA um, reimburse, uh, CEP reimbursement estimator. And um, I printed out two different scenarios for us. I know I keep saying um, a lot of it will depend on the participation and that's, that is the biggest factor in, in my eyes here. Um, but I also wanted to show you how kind of simple this, um, this calculator is that the USDA is asking us to fill out just to make sure that we will be you know, financially financially viable under CEP. So the, um, the numbers on the sheet in red are the only numbers that I have to input to see what our financials will look like for the following year. So um, up top is scenario one, and then down at the bottom I gave a second scenario. So um, we enter in our ISP, which is um, the number of identified students based off of our direct certification numbers, which the, we pull from the state, um, our total student enrollment, which looks a little bit lower than our actual student enrollment because the state wants us to only include students that have seats in the district. So this isn't including, this number can't include students who are like open and, you know, open enrolled out or anything like that. Oh, okay. um, and then we input the number of, uh, the total number of lunches and breakfasts we served in a month. So that's step three there. I used March of 2024 numbers. And then down at the bottom, um, we, under step four, you can see the um, expected increase in participation. So I, that's the only change from scenario one to scenario two. Um, I changed by 5% participation. So um, I increased national school lunch program to increase by 35% and the breakfast program to increase by 40%. Um, that's estimating low based off of our um, numbers that we ran from when we did seamless summer when all the meals were free after COVID. Um, and then I, on the second scenario, ran the same numbers with only 30% and 40%. So you can see down at the bottom on scenario one um, that we would have a positive increase in our reimbursement from the state versus um, scenario two where we adjusted by only 5% difference and um, you can see that that would have a negative impact on our reimbursement from the state. So that, that's kind of that sweet spot for us where I hope we'll be for participation in order to really thrive on this, um, the CEP program. That's all I have for you. So this will take effect this coming school year? Yes. And then those that had a rollover balance in their um, lunch accounts. Does that just sit there? Does it get reimbursed to the parent? So the positive balances you're saying, mm -hmm. um, either or, yeah. So um, they'll they'll stay in the account. The positive balance will stay in the account. If families request a refund, we could do that through the treasurer's office. Um, but more than likely, most of the families would probably keep it in for a la carte purchases. Okay. Um, that is something that we've seen in the past with um, with COVID, with the COVID free years was that a lot of the money um, in accounts they were using and purchasing extra a la carte. So if normally we were doing, I don't know, $5,000 in a la carte sales um, during COVID, we did at times, not all the time, see increases in those a la carte sales because they weren't paying for the meals. So those accounts will still be active then? Yes. Okay. Yeah. If they have a negative balance and this, are we able to go back and retroactively eliminate those balance, the negative balances on accounts? No, we're no, not. I, I, I wish know. we could. As we <laughs> did no. this year, yeah. we have to transfer from the general fund. Okay. 
because our policies aren't set up and uh, yeah. I don't know if they're going to change it for next year so moving forward you wouldn't have this issue. Um, but we have to wipe out the uh, That's why that I was wondering if they just, yeah, transfers. okay. Okay, thank you. Michelle, can you clarify for the board then what, I mean, I see step two federal reimbursement rates and I see estimated CP monthly federal reimbursement. What is going to be the dollar amount of the free lunch that is paid to the district? So um, every, lunch. every lunch then would be paid at that $3, about $3.02. And so well, that's not on the 427 that shows. Well, that's. Okay. That would be paid at that um, 64 percent, or 60, yeah, 64 percent of the students would get paid at that. But if you're calculating out as a total, as a whole, um, what the state, and so that that's that green box over there in the corner. Mm -hmm. um, it's estimating that per lunch you would actually be receiving three dollars and two cents when you calculate in. Now this is based off of our current that's numbers. That's cost average. Average. Okay. Yes. But, but I wanted to clarify that you so. You get 427 for free. Correct. But the paid then gets 42 cents. Correct. So they're taking the average based on, you know, I input Mar March of 24 numbers. They're taking the average of that. And then what our identified student population is, yeah. So I just have to caution the board. I mean, I know, Michelle, you brought it up, I think, two meetings ago that you'd like to see us go see the team. And, and I'm not against it, but the board needs to know there are risks. Oh, yes. Um, many districts, well, Ashtabula has been CP, and if you talk to their treasurer, said, yeah, they still lose money on the deal because of the paid amount. So sure. instead of getting, what do we charge for paid lunch right now at the high school and different rate at the elementary? Um, high school, it's $3.20. $3.20. Yeah. Now you're getting 42 for that 35% that don't right. get that 64. The other thing is a lot of districts were, uh, considering CEP and, and, and entering into the agreement based on the thought that because they go CEP, they're going to get more DPIA funding through the state. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, Pine Ridge Union Valley Can you let everybody know what the DPIA, I don't, I'm, I Well, it's, it used to be economically disadvantaged funding. Now right. DPIA is uh, develop, um, pupil impact aid. Um, Disadvantaged pupil impact, impact aid, aid yeah. is DPIA. So it's the same thing as economic disadvantage funding. Um, we get funding for that through the state as part of our foundation payment. And many districts thought that, okay, they go CP, now they're 100 instead of 40 or 25, and they'll get more of this DPIA funding. Pima Tuning Valley had a simulation run by their front line of Forecast 5 Analytics, and they looked that they were going to lose 300000 in their cafeteria because of the lower paid rate, mm -hmm. but they were going to gain as a district 700000 in their general fund, so they net 400000 You know, that's what they thought. But information has come out recently that that's not how it works at the state. If more people go in, the money, it, you, you, there's only so much money. Money, I was just so saying, they have to disperse it. Yeah, exactly. A number of districts are now seeing that they're getting less DPIA funds. Mm -hmm. So they're not getting the windfall that they thought. Um, because of the risks, I advise Dave and Michelle that if the district wishes to go CEP, I think that the board ought to vote, take a vote on that and, and have it be a board decision so that it's not cast on any one sure. person that you come back later and say, well, I well why did you do that? Yeah, <laughs> right. And the good thing is, and, and for a while, the, the word was, no, if you committed, you had to be four years, but Michelle has checked it out and said that, yes, you can, if it doesn't work out. That's good to know. You can pull out, a, you, you can reevaluate and pull out a one is year. Is there a million, minimum time we have to be in it? Like, you can pull out after 90 days or? They didn't say anything about a minimum time. Um, it just said that if, at any time you wanted to um, revoke your interest in the CEP, that they would allow like a 30-day window of some sort to uh, you know receive applications and that sort of thing, notify families. But it didn't. I mean, if it if it were up to me, I would say we wouldn't do it mid-year by any means. Right. But like after year one, like it would be a summer discussion here. Yeah. Hey, we've made some you know 
we, we didn't make any financial gains with this, um, and so we would start a new school year notifying families of the change, submitting out applications, that sort of thing. And that is my understanding. And after you go through the base year, <coughs> you can reevaluate it and decide whether you want to continue for the remaining two years. Or so that's what you're so recommending, Michelle? Yes. That we try at least for a year and see yes. how it does? Mm -hmm. I think that's a good idea. And Dave, too, right? Yes. You're on board with this? Of course. Michelle? Um, so Michelle has done a, a phenomenal job in, in running numbers left and right and left <laughs> and right and left and right and over. Analyzing it, uh, even bringing in some colleagues of hers that have run this program for in other districts. Um, so I, I, I trust Michelle's judgment and believe that we should try at least for the for the year. Sure, yeah. that, we, that would be my recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. You're welcome. Any other questions, right? That is separate <clears throat> agenda item. No, you would want to make a motion and second it right here. I was going to say yes. yes. Even though it's not on the agenda? I mean, it is well, on the agenda. The item is on the but agenda. Not as a voting item. It, but yeah, it wasn't it. originally, but I had I had cautioned them. That I, I yeah. think so I'll make a motion that we try it. I agree. That yes. we try it. I yes. agree. I'll motion. So we have a motion party. from Mrs. Ortiz. Do we have a second? I'll second. Any other discussion? Roll call, please. Mrs. Dixon? Milliken Dixon? Yes. Mrs. Ortiz? Yes. Mr. Pearson? Yes. Mrs. Cybalski? Yes. And Mrs. Craig. Yes. There we go. Thank you. You got Thank your you. program. Okay. Next up, we have Scott Ola, Director of um, Maintenance and Transportation. He always does come in the June meeting and, and presents a kind of a summer update and uh, an outlook on where we stand currently within his departments. <coughs> Good evening. So from a transportation aspect, all 29 of our buses have been inspected by Highway Patrol and all have passed now. Yes. So, it's a, it's a huge bonus. Of yes, it is. <laughs> Much better than where we've been in the past. Yes, thank you. Uh, we have three new standard buses and one new full-length DD bus that will incorporate into the fleet next year. Okay. Throughout the summer, we'll get well, hopefully radios, <laughs> GPS, cameras, all that installed over the summer so we can incorporate those next year. I'm sorry. I am even more nervous than Michelle. I'm, like, shaking horribly. <laughs> You always sound so calm, so we'll that's, that's it's, what's so funny. Right. It's not us laughing at Ignore you. Them, You're like, Scott. Ignore I'm them. so it's just nervous us. right now. Right. It's just us. Uh, for our summer months, we've started utilizing some of our technology software for our routing, for our summer camps, our summer school. Just so This is something we've had, but we've never been able to utilize fully. So we've been trying to acclimate ourselves with that and utilizing that to streamline the whole process of not just using pins on a map with strings and looking like conspiracy theorists. <laughs> <laughs> so it's software we've had but never really used before? Correct. Okay. Yeah, we've, we've had it for a while, but we've never been able to fully utilize it, whether it was because of time or because we had a problem uploading student data, addresses, phone numbers into the system. These are all the bugs we've been working out of the system now. Okay. That's why we're trying over the summer months where we have 54, we had 54 summer school students and I think 18 camp students in order to, we have a smaller sample size to try it out. This way we're not trying to with 1,200 students and right. it being a disaster on the first day of school. Yes, we appreciate that. Um, we sold three of our old buses through public auction. Last one was picked up on June 19th. That's important so that way we can incorporate the four new ones into the system and we get the old ones out of it just because of the timeline of the state for when you have to get these done. That's all I have for the maintenance aspect, or the transportation aspect. As for maintenance, we'll be installing new playground equipment at each elementary school, musical merry playground equipment at each of them, and then Ozenberg also has a handicap swing that we'll be installing there as well. We'll be mulching the playgrounds, repairing rubber playground surfacing at Geneva Flat R. Spencer, resurfacing blacktop parking lots of Cork and GPS as well. Cork will get a different traffic pattern there to try to streamline the process of parents getting backed up and almost out in 534. That'll be good. And then, not good. Traffic pattern? Oh my gosh. Never dropped anybody off there. The last thing I have is just getting the drainage problem at the Cork playground fixed so that way we don't have anything puddling there anymore. Yes. Wonderful. 
I mean, thank you. <laughs> I mean, I've been pounding that drum for like a year and a half. <laughs> so that's all I got for you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Olaf. Thank you. Scott, I would yes. like to tell you thank you so much. I know your job is a heavy lift and you're doing 7,000 different things and you are so appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Just a couple of items on my end before moving forward. Um, as I've, I've spoken to the board and, and put, we've put some constant contact and some other uh, information out, we, the district, is moving forward with the final forms platform. Uh, it will get rolled out on July 1st. Our current platform that we've been using for the last handful of years was from the Link Company. Um, we have experienced so many parent complaints, staff complaints, registration complaints from Mrs. Horvath, um, and the timeliness of their responses to our inquiries, if they ever happened, was very lengthy, and we were troubleshooting our stuff on our own. So therefore, we did some investigations, and uh, we're moving into the final forms, which is a, uh, a great opportunity for the, the registration process will be much more streamlined. We've already had some training on it. Uh, it is quite simply, it will allow the families to complete and sign ac academic and athletic forms for their students. Information, unlike the current system, it will be saved from year to year. So the only thing that a family will need to do is go into the system and click a couple of buttons, a couple of buttons saying everything is good, we're all set. Um, it will also allow us to review data anytime for accuracy. Parents can be required to sign forms only once a year and then just simply update after that. But it can also be implemented and, and added to and accessed through a computer or a smartphone, which is something that the previous company uh, did not allow us to do. Um, on July 1st, families will be receiving an email from Final Forms. There will also be a phone calls and some uh, all calls, text messages and going out leading up to that. Um, and also on that morning, we will be putting out what the company calls as a parent playbook that is essentially a two-page document that actually tells a parent how to go into the system, how to create an account. It has screenshots included to it. It's a step-by-step -step process um, to allow them to, to enroll uh, their students in the, in the various clubs, activities, registration for the building and whatnot. Um, as a uh, parent who's used it in the past and several of our staff members and administrators in other districts have used it in the past, I will say as a parent, it's phenomenal. It is challenging though, I would caution those that um, think they, they're gonna get on and, and it'll be done in 30 seconds. It takes a handful of minutes the first time out of the gate. But once it's in the system, it's, it's legitimately very good. So this is a significant step forward for our district. Um, Mrs. Horvath is ecstatic. The athletic department is ecstatic. Um, we've heard nothing but positive feedback from the parents that kind of already know it's coming the coaches, some of the staff members. So it looks like this um, will be a good rollout come July 1st. And it looks like it'll be a very good step forward for the district with respect to um, having something in place, especially to allow us to collect emergency medical forms right out of the gate, um, as opposed to the delays that we've had throughout the course of the year. So I just want families to know that that is coming. Look for your email on July 1st. Would you be, Dave, would you be able to push out to like, Beth, Jamie, and myself, we have kids in the district before July 1, let us fill it out and, and see if it all goes as planned. Um, I can reach out to Mrs. Horvath, uh, okay. Mr. Mark and John, and Mr. King. Uh, we'll, we'll be helping with so that. We can that see that if we way, can I mean, do that. That way, if there's Even a problem, it's, stuff, we can help, you know. Yeah. So we'll try to get it out to a handful of folks. Okay. Um, I know we've created some test, um, test students. There's, uh, my name happens to be in that for some reason for Mrs. Horvath, and it's worked out well. Where are you in, Davey? Um, I think I'm a kindergartner, actually, starting all over again. I agree with that. Um, so anyway, some positive feedback, so we're looking forward to kind of rolling that out. Um, once we get to, later on in the agenda, if it's approved by the Board of Education, we do have a few new hires that are on the docket, and they are here in attendance, so when we get to that point, we'll take some time to recognize them, um, should it be warranted at that point in time. Um, and finally, am I on the, uh, we are planning on eight, August 15th from five to seven o'clock here at the high school in Eagle Bash is what we're calling it. It's a, uh, well, I guess what we're calling is really a celebratory event to kick off the school year with our students and our staff and our families, um, bringing in uh, various businesses. And it's more so, in my opinion, it's more so just not celebrating all the great things we have here in our school district, but all of the wonderful things that we have here in our community. Uh, we've got a great, uh, 
community overall, very supportive of what we're trying to do. This would be just a very nice way on a positive note to start off our school year. So we hope that everybody uh, will mark their calendars for August 15th from 5 to 7. It'll be here in the, in the, in the high school's uh, front parking lot there. Uh, we'll be getting out more information about that uh, come July and going into August. Um, and it will be a free event for the families, so we'll make sure that's clearly known. And whatever we're providing will be free for everyone. Finally, on my end, I'd just like to thank um, everybody in the community, the Board of Education, uh, the staff and the teachers and, and, the, and the classified staff. We've got a great staff here. We have a great, a phenomenal student body and just a wonderful community um, that we work together to be successful at. We had a fantastic school closing with, and district closing with everything that's been going on. And I'm looking forward to opening up the school year um, in 24 or 25 just as successful as we possibly can. So just thank you to everybody. I'm just very grateful. And that's all I have at this point. Thanks, Mr. Riley. Okay, where are we? Policies, right? The substitute superintendent recommends a motion to accept the following new revised and replacement policies for, for board adoption. Moved. Second. Any discussion? I have an item I'd like to discuss. Policy number 8640, transportation for non-routine trips. I would like us to clarify better what the district pays for and what the support group pays for. Music boosters, athletic boosters. Um, we ran into an issue sending the choir to a competition and our policy currently says um, the board will provide vehicles for all other trips, including co-curricular, athletic, blah, blah, blah. Mileage charge will be assessed and paid for by the sponsoring organization, but it doesn't say anything in here about outside transportation being called in. So we ended up, and again, Scott was instrumental in getting us, uh, getting the choir to Cedar Point that day. Um, but I, I think we need to clarify what we pay for because because it was a competition. And any other competition that the children attend, whether it be, uh, what's the academic challenge, right, that the academic boosters go to, or any athletic events that are competition-based, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and for GAMBA, the music boosters have to pay for outside transportation. I didn't, I didn't find that to be appropriate or fair. I hate using the word fair because life isn't Equitable. fair. Equitable. But, but for lack of a better word, fair. It doesn't seem right that they go and hope to bring home a trophy and they almost didn't go because um, the district wouldn't cough up the money. And I don't mean, I'm not blaming you guys. I'm just saying I think the system and the policy needs looked at. Correct me if I'm wrong. I thought they almost didn't go because there was no transportation available. That's why we had to go outside. Correct. We did not have um, school transportation. The drivers. Yes. Was, was the issue on that day. Um, so then we had to hire outside transportation. Correct. I believe the policy, and in, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the policy just speaks to our school transportation. I don't believe it addresses particular policy. I don't believe it addresses any outside transportation. That's what I mean. So there, I don't know if there's another policy in our currently in our at, at board that has that policy handbook, but that's certainly something we can look into with Neola. But in terms of this policy, I believe this policy is just exclusively just for our district. I don't know. I just use this as a, as a jumping off point for this discussion. So I'd like us to either have a policy or fix the policy that says outside transportation is paid for by X. And I'm not in any way suggesting who should pay for which. What I'd like to do is discuss that and figure out. It's probably a different policy because this one specifically speaks to our. I know. So I couldn't find another policy. Um, related to this closer than this. So I think there may just not be one about outside transportation. This is a recent year's Issue. difficulty, right? Mm -hmm. We always used to have bus drivers lining up to do field trips and whatnot, and that's not the case anymore. So I, I want to look at it. I want to figure it out. They see the, the policy is for non-routine use of a bus, and that's governed by Ohio Revised Code, and that's why the information is in your policy. And it says that districts, and you know, I, I understand it's a competition, but it's not a mandatory competition. It's optional for 
the is quiet academic dissent challenge mayors mandatory? Group. No, but district I, paid for that, correct? Did they? When I don't my daughter was on academic challenge, we I don't have an answer for that. Oh, you drove them. Yeah. We didn't oh, drive no. them. Um, Jenny went on a bus. Was, academic uh, challenge uh, took a van this took year. A, van. a school van. Mm -hmm. A school yeah. van. I think they, they take, did in 22 as well. Because Jenny, we didn't take them. Has anything changed now that they're officially part of like the CBC? Um, or, but for academic challenge, they did have school transportation in a van. How mm -hmm. that was paid for, I don't, I don't have the answer to that. I just know. The kids went in the van provided by the school. And the school vans are used for student activity, right. provided that the driver is a certified right. driver of the van. But what I'm getting at is non routine use of a school bus, then if you have to, because you have no school bus, replace it with a purchase service transportation. Basically, the same thing applies. School districts are not allowed to just pay for most of this non routine use. That's why it says the organization, whether it's a uh, booster group or an outside organization when we had assumption we used they used to contact us for field trips you have to pay the full cost which includes um, the m mileage charge for well, or, or gas charge and the cost of the bus driver so it does say in here though it says the board will provide the vehicles for all other trips including co-curricular athletic and other extracurricular trips but a mileage charge will be assessed to cover the cost of the driver and the fuel. This charge is to be paid by the sponsoring organization. But there's so, nothing in our policy about who pays for the actual vehicle if we don't have a driver of our own. A driver in a vehicle from Sunset Taxi, for example, who we use all the time. Um, so I think we need to do one. So what do we do? Ask Neola how to write that? Correct. I can, I can speak with Neola and, and see if there is a policy that out there that speaks okay. to that. Um, it just gained their feedback. Good, thank you. Any other discussion on that? Um, uh, sorry, go ahead. you have another question? No. Before you take a vote, I'd also just like to note that uh, policy 4124, as I was reviewing that, has a change that I don't, I don't remember it really be putting, being it, uh, put out there, but this affects our classified staff. For the longest time, the revised code specified how we issue contracts. For classified, it's one year, any part of a year is one year. Then they get a two year, and then they get a continuum. Mm -hmm. So it's a quick path to continuum. This policy, due to House Bill 33, I guess, which passed last year, has changed that timeline for contracts. So after the one year, you follow with three two year contracts. So one year, two year, two year, two year, and after the third two year contract, then continuing. So this is going to be something new that has to be followed that we haven't done before. So I just want to make that note. I'm glad you pointed that out. Mm -hmm. That's definitely new and it's going to, it might be a little cumbersome at first just because it's something completely foreign to what we've done before. Yes. I didn't realize that, I don't think. I think I did. Because wasn't Scott one of those? He was only here a couple months and then got a two year because he had completed his first year. But he only really completed a couple months. But we counted as a year, but then. Right. Right. Okay. And it's always been that way. I mean, yeah, partial kind of year, it, is, it counts as one year. Okay. Any other questions or comments about that one? Okay. I think we're ready to adopt, right? So I need a motion to adopt the policy we changes? We have the motion and second. We just need to vote now. Oh, we did that already. So I need a roll call, please. Mrs. Ortiz? Yes. Mr. Pearson? Yes. Mrs. Cybalski? Yes. Mrs. Craig? Yes. And Mrs. Milliken-Dixon? Yes. Substitute superintendent recommends approval of the enclosed resolution, which is an authorizing agreement with Northeast, Communi Northeast Communication Security uh, for the radio upgrade project. Moved. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Mr. Pearson? Yes. Mrs. Cybalski? Yes. Mrs. Craig? Yes. Mrs. Milliken Dixon? Yes. And Mrs. Ortiz? Yes. The substitute superintendent recommends approval of the enclosed agreement from In Compliance Consulting National Purchasing Consortium Membership Agreement. Can I get a motion? Moved. 
Second. Any discussion? Can you share a little bit, Dave? Can you elaborate some? I can't. Let me give, give me a moment to pull it up. Mr. Lilly, do you have it in front of you that you've got something? I, I have no. <laughs> I just didn't know for everybody else, in, just uh, a general right? Yeah, pass the ball laterally. Look at me with sports metaphor. Yes. So is this to buy things at a discount? Is that what? Well, this is specifically in line, these two items, um, number six and seven are basically together. And I believe it's uh, because Mr. Regard had a, uh, a, an HVAC project. Yes. And in talking, it, it would require going out to bid and the attorney suggested, legal counsel suggested that we could participate and they had created a national purchasing consortium and we could go through that. They actually do the bid. It would save some time and money Perfect. to get the project done. Uh, we also are doing this utilizing ESSER funds, so there's a timeline on those funds. They're, they're gone in December. Mm -hmm. um, so I think these two items facilitate that. As far as what the exact project is, uh, I, I don't know. I believe you're correct. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the HVAC that, there, that he's been, and he's been doing a lot of research on this with a lot of different mm -hmm. companies. Um, Jared, um, like many of us overthinks and wants to make sure it's making the best decision possible for the longevity of the district. So you're correct, Mr. Lilly. Thank you. But do you know what the HVAC project is? Or what, is it uh, replacing units, VADs? I thought I was replacing units myself. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. Uh, we did motion already, didn't we? Yep. So we need a roll call, please. Mrs. Cybalski? Yes. Mrs. Craig? Yes. Mrs. Milliken Dixon? Yes. Mrs. Ortiz? Yes. And Mr. Pearson? Yes. The substitute Superintendent recommends approval of the enclosed resolution authorizing membership in the Compliance Consulting National Purchasing Consortium. Moved. Second. Discussion? Roll call, please. Mrs. Craig? Yes. Mrs. Milliken Dixon? Yes. Mrs. Ortiz? Yes. Mr. Pearson? Yes. And Mrs. Cybalski? Yes. Substitute Superintendent recommends that the board approve the enclosed revised middle school handbook for the 24 25 school year. Moved. Second. Um, I want to thank the administrators for working with us on the backpack situation. Um, I appreciate you taking it out of the handbooks. We appreciate you doing that. And um, we're willing to open that up to more discussion. And there's only one of you here. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? We're going to open it up, come up with ideas. Mrs. Craig and myself have been spitballing ideas about what, what to replace that policy with, what the issues are, and how we can solve them without the full on banning of the backpacks. So I wanted to thank you for that. I think this is also a great opportunity to get the students involved, especially um, at the high school level, whether it be through a, a principal's Challenge advisory or board yeah. or something where, I, I, like we said last time when this came up, kids need a voice. That's who we're here to represent. And um, this would be a great starting point, leaping point for that. And just to throw it out there again about having um, we're gonna probably wanna knock out some conversations about what that would look like. We discussed that towards the end of the school year about having a student representative like w during the class election time. So I don't know if we need to speak with you know class advisors and get an idea of what that would look like so that we're ready to roll when school starts and they're gonna do those officer elections yeah. so the kids can be a part of that process as well. Yeah, I've already talked to the high school folks about it, Mrs. Markajan and um, Mrs. DeBecker and people that are involved in the right. senior class stuff. Um, so yeah, if we could get um, whomever chooses those officers in the, when do they do that? Around middle well, of September? Well, they usually, they do the class officers usually September, early October, and I thought that would be a good time to 
push that out. But again, they may have a better vision of that than we do, but yeah. just conversations that need to be had. It would so be great to have students up on oh, here. Oh, that's exactly, yeah, October absolutely. November. Absolutely. That would be great. And at our OSBA uh, Board 101, uh, back in, what, March now, I think, um, we had talked to some representatives from Cuyahoga Falls, uh, as well as the Beechwood District, some people from Orange and others that were explaining the liaisons between the student body as well as uh, the public uh, and different interested organizations. And so they already have kind of a template where we could take it and make it yeah. more accustomed to what Geneva's needs are. Um, but these exist in, in districts that have very, very high valued you know, scorecards, not just academics, sports, extracurriculars, mm -hmm. co-curriculars, uh, and so on and so forth. And so it would be kind of nice to take a, a leaf out of their book and, and hit the ground running with that kind of, of initiative that you guys are, are already showing and see maybe what works best for us. Uh, those people are open for communicating to all of us. Yeah. I can even, uh, obviously for distribution outside of this meeting, uh, but not for discussion, share those contacts with, with everyone here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I apologize, I have one more thing I wanted to say about the handbook. Oh, I wanted it. I did not forget, I've been thinking about it for a month. Five weeks. I owe Mrs. Craig a public apology. I snapped at her last month when the handbook came up on a topic that was emotional for me, and I didn't, I didn't react well. I reacted emotionally, and I wanted to apologize to her in front of everyone. So, oh, thank you, Marty. That's wonderful. All right. So, where are we? We have second and first, right? So we need a vote. Roll call, please. Mrs. Milliken Dixon. Yes. Mrs. Ortiz. Yes. Mr. Pearson. Yes. Mrs. Cybalski. Yes. And Mrs. Craig. Yes. The substitute superintendent recommends that the board approve the enclosed revised high school handbook for the 24-25 school year. Motion? Wait. So move. Uh, second. Second. <laughs> second. Any discussion? I just want to say ditto. I meant my comments to be prior school and middle school. Uh, roll call, please. Mrs. Ortiz? Yes. Mr. Pearson? Yes. Mrs. Cybalski? Yes. Mrs. Craig? Yes. And Mrs. Milliken Dixon? Yes. Can I do this one? Um, the recommendation is on here that the board approve the enclosed resolution declaring it necessary to renew an existing 0.85 mil tax levy for the purpose of general ongoing permanent improvements and requesting the Ashtabula County Auditor to make certain certifications uh, pursuant to the sections of the Ohio Revised Code. We get a motion? Moved. Second. Any discussion? Um, I think we need to have some discussion about what a levy committee would look like at this point. Yep. Has anyone been contacted about interest in doing that? We've mentioned it at the board meetings a couple of times. Has anyone got any? I haven't had anybody reach out to me. I do have a few ideas of, of people we might want to reach out to that would be. People we want to ask of all Like if we want to talk real nice and see what they will do and go from there. But I think all of us could come up with a few names that if we personally had reached out to them and perhaps have, you know, Kevin have a conversation with them. That Do you want to be, be point person? Like send it to you, the people? You want to send that, it to me? That would be fine, but maybe both of us, Kevin? Well, I, I, again, we have to be careful. I know. Superintendent I know. Treasurer, even in, in that, I mean, it's almost yeah. important. What I can do is supply information. So. Let, tell us how you would like to go about it because I don't want to make it more convoluted than it has to be, but we have to get the word out in the community and we have to have right. some discussions. But it's just according to the guidance, yes. treasurers and superintendents are considered 24-7. Right. Yeah. So it's very difficult for us to be trying to line up people to serve on so the committee. So it's more <coughs> a board task to do that. I will be the point person. Once you have a committee. I can do it. I can do it. I got gotcha. you. Either one. The board, the treasurer, superintendent are always permitted to share factual information. Perfect. And supply them with whatever they need uh, along that line. So we can't make copies. Sure, I understand. Levy committee, that type of thing. But um, we definitely can provide information. Okay, I will be the point person, and I have a few ideas name wise that I'll reach okay. out to them, and then I can loop you into. Perfect. Okay. If anyone has any interest or knows anyone who has any interest, we need help. The board and superintendent and admins have been severely restricted now. And so uh, we need other people to do it besides these guys. 
So if you want to help, let us know, and we'll get it together. Does anybody on the board know whether we have a levy committee treasurer? And if that, for the longest time, I might know somebody I could ask to see if they knew who that last person was. Well, Mr. Santiago was well, the last that's, person. I was, one, I was, yeah, and I wanted to reach and out to I, see if. I know that Jennifer Capo had contacted yes. me because she was trying to locate the levy committee accounts and thought they were at one bank and they weren't. They were at another bank, um, but I don't know that that she was going to fill that role. Agree. Agree, and when I and I don't know that I know Jerry's not going to fill that role, but I was he would know people to contact that were a part of that before that could get that ball rolling for Perfect. us. So, okay. So and I would just add about this item that this is the last opportunity mm -hmm. for the board to renew this levy, and being that it's a renewal, it does save taxpayers money on the rollback in the homestead at any future time if the board this fails and the board needed to go mm -hmm. for a PI levy, it would be at the full yeah, cost. Exactly. Um, yeah. to Once more years. for those in the back. <laughs> if we pass it in November, it's the cheapest we can get it. If we miss that opportunity and have to go start over, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be a higher rate, okay, right? So. It's like we gotta get the right aid right now because they're closing, scoop up all their makeup that's half off, right? That's what Geneva has to do with this levy. This, um, 0.85 mil levy, when it was last certified by the county auditor, was effective at 0.499 mil. So that's the effective collection rate. However, that's going to go down further due to the triennial update that we just had. Yep. Yep. So the effective rate will be even uh, less. Uh, it is used to purchase a number of permanent improvements in the district, and the, the main thing has been to purchase school buses. Now, we were fortunate over the last couple of years to update our fleet mm -hmm. using ESSER funds and get a lot of new buses in. But when it comes time to start replenishing the, the buses, which I, basically I think we're down, according to Mr. Ola, down to one 2010 bus and everything else is newer. 12, 14. Mm -hmm. But you know, a 14 bus is already 10 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so they will need to be replaced at some point in the future. The amount that this levy raises is, is was enough to purchase two buses, but going forward won't be quite enough mm -hmm. to purchase those two buses because of the rising cost of two They don't buses. need back wheels, Absolutely. do they? Hmm? They need all the wheels. Can't leave off the back wheels and get a cheaper bus. All right. Anything else on that? Yeah, I, I just want to say really quickly, uh, we can't give an opinion of, of what we think on this. And I think that many people yes, are, are afraid <laughs> in going forward that we're going to be crippled and have to take, you know, multitude of, of criticisms. But what I would, what I would warn people of, is um, if you're worried about a present service, uh, and you're worried about the quality, the quantity, and the ability it's able to be performed, if you reduce the amount of money being poured into that program, you could expect the result of that action. And there is nothing other than hard numbers here. We know that there are several things that people are concerned with. We would love to make the almighty dollar move in a million directions, but when you do so, you make that dollar a lot less valuable. And that is just a basic principle of economics. We can definitely tell there's some frustration in the community. We, you know, I, for just my spe myself, I can tell you that I think that the restriction of me being able to even put a personal opinion attached to this is somewhat moot. I understand it, but if we were living on the salary, I would understand it a little bit more. Um, you can look up all of our salaries publicly. You'll find that it is not a substantial amount. We are not enriching ourselves. You know, our money, our, our pay doesn't go up with this operating levy, and you, you can find that in the public record. Um, I would encourage anyone in the community that would like to share the facts about this with their fellow parents from the perspective of a parent or a community member it looks a lot better than a board member telling you why the Board of Education needs more money, and we would be very, very, very open to that help. Thank the you. The board doesn't need more money. The students need the same amount of money we've been getting for, what is it? For student services. years or something? And, and I personally, and I, I can't speak for others here, but I think that they would agree, this board is hyper-focused on, on returning student services, and, and that is our, our goal. Thank you, Mr. Pearson. Anything else? Roll call, please. Mr. Pearson? 
Yes. Mrs. Cybalski? Yes. Mrs. Craig? Yes. Mrs. Milliken Dixon? Yes. And Mrs. Ortiz? Yes. The treasurer recommends that the board renew its membership in the Ohio Co Coalition for Equity and Adequacy of School Funding for 24 25. Moved. Second. Any discussion, questions, comments? Roll call, please. Mrs. Cybalski? Yes. Mrs. Craig? Yes. Mrs. Milliken Dixon? Yes. Mrs. Ortiz? Yes. And Mr. Pearson? Yes. The treasurer recommends adoption of the appro appropriations as presented for the fiscal year 23-24. Um, permanent total appropriations from each fund. General fund. All other appropriations are approved by the fund. Moved. <laughs> Second. Any discussion? <clears throat> Just so that, you know, this is the final amended appropriation resolution for the district it yeah. needs to be, in order to be in compliance cover all of our expenditures and all of our funds and as you see we're approving it uh, by the second digit of function first digit of object and all other appropriations are just approved by the funds so we had to get all those new funds that we're setting up on here uh, as well as the uh, appropriation to cover the expenditures for some associated scholarships Anything else? Roll call, please. Mrs. Craig? Yes. Mrs. Milliken Dixon? Yes. Mrs. Ortiz? Yes. Mr. Pearson? Yes. And Mrs. Cybalski? Yes. Treasurer recommends 24 25 fiscal year appropriations. Effective July 1, 23. Oh, oh sorry. 13. 13. Approval of advances and transfers between funds and the authorization of such transfers as needed within funds. Moved. Second. Discussion? So it Details is, at the meeting. Yeah, details <laughs> at the meeting. So I passed out to you a one-page summary of the transfers and advances. Again, no advances are needed from the general fund. Uh, there are transfers uh, to the athletic fund, 86,170 and to the band transportation account, which is uh, the account set up for any transportation to away football games and band camp if, if they choose to go away for band camp. 3,292.51 for a total of 89,463.47. The rest of the transfers listed on here are more for informational purposes as they're required by our participation in Title I transferability school-wide pool. So as a result of that participation, we have to receipt our Title IIA and IVA dollars into those particular funds. But because all the spending is going out of Title I, going through Title I, we have to then transfer that money to Title I. Just a little logistical nightmare created by the state to um, bump the money around. Instead of just putting it in Title I, spending it, and, and receiving it that in there, make sense. it That's has to uh, continue <laughs> through the recipient funds. So, um, because that is a transfer, it's, it's on there just so you can see what that's going on. Any questions about that? The transfer um, to athletics, is that a similar amount or is that Let's higher? get a little higher. And, and one of the things driving it up is purchase service transportation. Mm -hmm. Cost more. Yeah. And I mean, Gen you know, costs go up each year. Mrs. Crossley knows mm -hmm. that, you know, the, the um, officials' costs went up. The security want more in, in order to get them mm -hmm. to our, our games. And, and so those costs go up, but probably the biggest thing that's made it rise the last few years is purchase service transportation. Anything else? Roll call, please. Mrs. Milliken Dixon? Yes. Mrs. Ortiz? Yes. Mr. Pearson? Yes. Mrs. Cybalski? Yes. And Mrs. Craig? Yes. The treasurer recommends 24-25 fiscal year appropriations, effective July 1, 23, um, to be established at 50% of 2020-24 expenditures and to be considered temporary. Moved. Second. Discussion. Details at the meeting. Well, actually, details will be presented at the next regular meeting. Oh, excuse meeting me, because next. The next fiscal meeting. year is not over, True. so we don't have the exact yeah, three expenditures more days to take right? a percentage of. Some districts might only do this at 25% uh, to cover the first quarter, but 
since permanent appropriations aren't approved until September, effective October 1st, and sometimes there are a lot of expenditures that are up front at the beginning of the school year, we've always done this at 50% just to make sure there's some coverage. So a district either has to start out with temporary appropriations to cover that beginning period, or they could do their permanent appropriations. And it takes a lot of time to do that now when you're closing out the end of the fiscal year. Right. So we will do, uh, after the close of the fiscal year, we will do that and we'll have the uh, temporary appropriation resolution available for you to see at the July board meeting. Okay. Anything else? Roll call, please. Mrs. Ortiz? Yes. Mr. Pearson? Yes. Mrs. Cybalski? Yes. Mrs. Craig? Yes. And Mrs. Milliken-Dixon? Yes. The treasurer recommends the following funds be appropriated according to the adopted budget. Moved. Second. Any discussion? This is just our federal funding for 24-25. You know, the big one is Title I and Part D IDA. As we mentioned, Title IV and Title IIA roll into Title I. And then we have the ECS, the Early Childhood Special Education IDEA, that uh, goes towards covering some of the expenses that are handicapped in school. Kelly gave a nice presentation. Anything else? Roll call, please. Mr. Pearson? Yes. Mrs. Cybalski? Yes. Mrs. Craig? Yes. Mrs. Milliken-Dixon? Yes. And Mrs. Ortiz? Yes. The treasurer recommends the establishment of the American Red Cross Scholarship Fund. Before you move, I, I need to modify this. Um, as I was setting these up, I forgot that we already have a 007 So what you're approving, that American Red Cross Scholarship Fund number, will be 007 Oh. I'm Moved. so glad you told me that. I know. I don't want to. <laughs> I would not have been able to sleep at night. <laughs> I would not have been able to sleep at night. Moved, Marty. All right. Second? Second. Any questions about that? Did y'all get the real number? So, 93? So as I said, the American Red Cross used to pay directly to students, but for some reason, according to Mrs. Martha John, I don't know if it should change for just this year. I'm thinking it's going to be a change going forward. I think it is. Going They're going forward. to give the money to the districts, and then yep. we, we will have to. So we're setting up that scholarship so that we can facilitate that. Perfect. Anything else? Roll call, please. Mrs. Cybalski? Yes. Mrs. Craig? Yes. Mrs. Milliken Dixon? Yes. Mrs. Ortiz? Yes. And Mr. Pearson? Yes. The treasurer recommends the establishment of the Here I Am Scholarship Fund in memory of Mark Brace. The scholarship will be awarded to one or more graduating students each year as selected by Olivia Brace and in the amount of $1,000 as funded through a donor advised fund account at Schwab Charitable. Interest will not be paid, excuse me, interest will not be credited to the scholarship. Moved. Second. Any discussion? So um, in this case, originally, Olivia Brace's intention was to award it directly, but I think she ran into a problem with the Schwab Charitable Foundation where it handles their money that they would also not make it out to a student, so they had mm -hmm. to send it to the school district. And, it, and for this year, she actually awarded two $1,000 scholarships, so $2,000 was received, and then we will be able to get the money out to the students and the reason for these two scholarships, interest not being credited, these basically in and out. Get the money right. each year, we pay the scholarship out, similar to the Fraternal Order of Eagles. So there's right. no money sitting in account to collect to interest. build and, and yeah. you know, to, to generate more Thank income you. down the road. So just so you know. I'm today years old and I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, roll call, please. Mrs. Craig? Yes. Mrs. Milliken Dixon? Yes. Mrs. Ortiz? Yes. Mr. Pearson? Yes. And Mrs. Cybalski? Yes. I'd like a motion for approval for Mrs. Cybalski to attend the OSBA Board 101 Summer Workshop. Moved. Second. Any discussion? Have fun. Yeah, I'm Have excited fun. to go um, and learn a little bit more about all of this that we're, we're doing. Well, <laughs> we did get in a big room with all of us board people. We're nuts. <laughs> uh, anything else? The roll call, please. Mrs. Milliken Dixon? Yes. Mrs. Ortiz? Yes. Mr. Pearson? Yes. Mrs. Cybalski? Dane. And Mrs. Craig. Yes. <coughs> substitute, the substitute superintendent recommends the following personal actions for the 23-24 contract here. 
Moved. Second. Any questions or comments? Concerns? Geez, how many pages are there? Four This one's short. This is 19, ends in page four. Oh, I see. I got you. Um, roll call, please. Mrs. Ortiz? Yes. Mr. Pearson? Yes. Mrs. Cybalski? Yes. Mrs. Gregg? Yes. And Mrs. Milliken Dixon? Yes. The substitute superintendent recommends the following personnel actions for the 24 25 contract year. Moved. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Mr. Pearson? Yes. Mrs. Cybalski? Yes. Mrs. Craig? Yes. Mrs. Milliken Dixon? Yes. And Mrs. Ortiz? Yes. As noted earlier, we do have a few of those uh, new hires that are in attendance this evening. We do appreciate them coming out. They are, um, have, after having gone through the interview process with them, they are quality individuals. Uh, the board has their resumes, just so that you're aware of the type of um, high quality and high character folks that we're bringing in. Um, Emily Corlew will be the language arts teacher at the high school. Any uh, relation? The name sounds so familiar. <laughs> Potentially. Do we know her? Caitlin Gillespie will be the th a third grade teacher over at GPS. Ashley Patterson will be a third grade teacher over at GPS. And Brianna Robert will be an elementary school counselor at Cork and Austinburg. I am loving that. Stay. Thank you all for coming and welcome aboard. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> welcome to the family. Welcome. Pad your uh, wardrobe with red clothes. <laughs> the substitute superintendent recommends the following volunteer coaches for the 24-25 school year. Moved. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Mrs. Cybalski? Yes. Mrs. Craig? Yes. Mrs. Milliken Dixon? Yes. Mrs. Ortiz? Yes. And Mr. Pearson? Yes. So we would like to have a discussion on, we think we're at the place in the athletic facility planning that we need to start looking at getting bids. So, yeah, uh, we want to find out how much this is going to cost us before we ask for the money. Well, then you don't mean bids. Well, what do I mean then? Bids is putting specs out, advertising, projects, getting bids, and before you do that, you would need to have the money. Okay. So you are more wanting to... Uh, as the gentleman um, who had the engineering background mentioned, Hutchins, Mr. Hutchins, mm -hmm. last meeting, um, be, you, you need to select an architect or engineer, uh, a design services professional. And in order to do that, you need to go through a qualitative, qualitative based process. Um, and once selected, then you can hire them to enter into an agreement with them to come up with cost for okay. the athletic facility. So what do we do first? Get a list together of who that might be? Architects? You put out, a, basically it's almost like putting out an RFP okay. of what you're looking for, yep. specifying the project, uh, and you get both technical proposals and cost proposals. You have to consider the technical proposals first. You, you rank them, one, two, three, and then the board approves something that then will allow you, allow superintendent, board president, treasurer, whoever, to uh, go and negotiate an agreement with the number one. Uh, we did this before. We weren't able to come up with an agreement with our number one that was acceptable, so we went to our number two. Um, but the process that the board did in the past for the different projects, the bus slash maintenance, maintenance garage, um, that was specific to that pro project uh, and could have carried over to the board. We ended up having to, if you recall, uh, junk them basically. We weren't being non-responsive yeah. to us. 
uh, about small the and engineering right. and then yeah. go into a new uh, process to, <coughs> to get somebody yeah. to complete that. that was really um, so thing. basically, as being a new project, you have to go out again uh, using this process. Okay, so, so who puts out the RPG or whatever you called it? RFP, what's it called? A uh, request for RFP. proposal, RFP. RFP. Request for proposal. The, the, the process is outlined in the revised yeah. code, so. And even before that, we may even want, like you had said, to the qualitative process, we may even want to set standards pre-qualitative process. So when we give an RFP, we're all in session and we outline however that may look or whoever we delegate that to of the things that we demand as these are our musts, these are our wants, these are our would really sweeten the deals, mm -hmm. and then quantitate that to pricing. So when we, as Mr. Lilly has, has pointed out, we say, hey, this is our budget to work with. These are kind of our, our biggest qualifications. It'll help us and the person giving the bid say, hey, this is kind of our sweet spot. This is the kind of facility we build is what you're asking for. And we can get competitive bids with the RFP that you're speaking of. OK. Mm -hmm. Well, um, now, you're not getting any bids I, for the I did say bid. I'm sorry, say Kevin. Bid. That was you're, that you're, was my fault. I thought you. I knew what you meant, but, yeah. <laughs> but nonetheless, you're also going to have to, you're selecting an architect or engineer, you're going to need to pay them for their work. You know, you have to decide what fund you're going to use. The PI fund would be a fund that you could use for, mm -hmm. for this um, initially, but obviously there's not enough money in the PI for the project. So, you know, architect's going to want to know how you're going to fund this project. Mm -hmm. And those funds haven't begun to be raised, right. however it's going to be. So okay. I, I thought your facility. We're, we're in a we're in a position though. In order for us to start writing grants and soliciting funds, we've got to have something that right. we can actually show them. Because so I'm not sure how we want to approach that. But there's many grants that are already in process of being awarded, and I don't want to sit in, on our thumbs and wait for the money to run out. We it's going to take some time. So we need to figure out how we're going to, you know, secure that number so that we can honestly and fulfill those applications and get the most that we possibly can. So the funds that could be used to pay for the services of a design professional would be the general fund or the PI fund. Um, and I would recommend you use the PI fund okay. for that. And there's enough money, I think, to cover, especially the initial cost of them putting together what you need. Th those are the components we need so we can start getting yeah. some Mr. figures. Hutchins yeah, gave a, yes. gave you a nice presentation and a nice view mm -hmm. of what your project might want to yes. look like, but now they would put the costs to it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and then, I mean, the process is to go to involve the grants or however right. you're going to raise the funds then to do that, which is going to be um, at some cost. Yes. Yeah, but Mrs. Craig is actually right, absolutely right. You know that we can't go ask for a grant from, let's say, we talked about um, FEMA, right, making part of it um, emergency preparedness, and that there's funds available. But we can't say to FEMA, we want to build a football field, so hand us some money. Like we have to have specifics to give them. Mm -hmm. In order to have those specifics, we have to hire mm -hmm. an architect or a contractor. Right? And so there, can we do something like tonight? Can we decide to do that? To put out the RFP and um, and hire a contractor out of the PI fund? Um, again, not knowing what your discussion was going to be, not knowing what you meant. This by is what it is. So well, <laughs> not knowing what you meant by facility bid discussion. Well, we don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> I'm going to have to go back to the revised code and okay. we can double check the, the, the process there. I, okay. I don't remember at this time because it's been a while since we did the process back in like 14 or 15. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's been about 10 years. It's been a minute, yeah. Okay. Um, if you have to take some action to go out with the RFP first. So you're, you're, not, we're not, you're not prepared okay. to do that at mm -hmm. this board meeting. So maybe if... There mm -hmm. is something can be on there. If not, you can talk about putting it together. Usually you would use legal counsel to put things together for this process. Okay. Um, right. 
which is I also We can move cost. Megan in yeah. Yeah. this evening. Mm -hmm. She's attending. Yeah. And if we want to have a discussion about this, I think the best thing would be if we find that to be you know evident and prior to the next meeting, if then we can always have a you know an open special session, session and we can you know ask people to come and have that conversation with us as well in and, session and um, there are also some I, i've been doing a little digging myself but i know there are some firms that are used to the request of coming up with a number so that you can facilitate paperwork and applications for grants and things of that nature so that's another avenue that we're going to want to consider because that rfp might look a little different if we're going to knowing what our end goal is we need to have some idea of dollars and cents before we start filling out these applications so that might be another piece that we went want to look at too as well mr lilly okay so do we table it for next meeting or do we do a mr pearson proposal you don't have do anything you don't have a motion we don't have anything just yeah. table. There's no there's I, I, I meant table. that's what i said like yeah. that like put this off till july um let kevin gather some information we can discuss with Megan. And we can discuss with Megan and then do July. Is that all right? Or more specific discussion? I just wanted to, we wanted to put it on the agenda. Right. right. So we share everybody what we've been, you know, we've been doing some legwork and some research into it. So, um, yeah, we needed to know what to do next. We don't want to put the cart before the horse, but we want the horse and cart both going in the right direction. <laughs> okay. So that was that. Thank you all. Again, if you have any um, interest in helping out, joining that committee, please let one of us know. Okay, public comments. So this is the portion of our meeting where we um, welcome the public to come and comment. Each commenter <laughs> gets five minutes for a total of 30 minutes for the entire um, section, for the entire item. Uh, please knit list your name and your address for the record if you come to the mic. Uh, Mr. Markertown, we don't have a mic. Oh, there you are. <laughs> you can come to the mic stand, but no one will be able to hear you. Test, Brown, test. To speak? Sammy Lechner, 1602 State Route 307, Austinburg. I always do fine sitting back there. Once I get up here, I get all nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to email all of you, but I didn't get to it. But I wanted to thank you all. Uh, as a first time uh, mother of a graduate, mm -hmm. it was nice to see you all at the graduation. Um, I know you guys probably have specific duties that you have to do as board members and you know you might not want to be at certain things or whatever but it was nice to see you all there and I know Mr. King isn't here but he recognized the ATEC students and had them stand that it just meant a lot because I just didn't anticipate any of my children attending ATEC I just figured well I never dreamed of them being in the Geneva school systems either because when I moved away, I didn't anticipate moving back. Same. So, <laughs> um, but I just, you know, I know a couple of you, and I know your parents, and I know you work, and I just want to thank you all um, for what you're doing, and just, just how everything has gone, and just appreciate you guys. Thank you. Thanks, well, thank, thank you. Thank you. Congratulations on your graduate. Does anyone else like to speak? Nobody else? I think maybe. <laughs> um, my name is Paul Stump, S-T-U-M-P-F-F, -F, 75 Fairview Road. Sorry, I only moved here in 1994. There are some people say that I don't have much to say about things because I wasn't born here. Hmm. 
Now, according to the Sports Center proposal, I wish you would, next meeting, you start over from the beginning. You don't have to give a whole big presentation. I have no idea when this communication from Spire was. Is it official? Is what official? It, it, it is that they won't renew? Uh, no. The contract no. is ending. Yeah, but I mean, do we have an official we have a verification that, from them that this end? No. We, we have an we expiration have date of a contract. So when the contract is done, there are no, there, there's no communications to extend that at this time. Okay. How much uh, the, uh, the other thing was is that has it been explained or been looked at at how this will affect their property tax, their situation? So the, the original Because facility, like we were saying back in 2010, this was supposed to be at a reduced rate for them. That, that was on an evaluation of $55 million. Uh, since then, they've sold several parcels, and the reevaluation uh, has reduced them to $5 million of evaluation. Mm -hmm. So those two numbers would not be comparable. I need to adjust for inflation, probably around a 2.74% rate to give you an accurate number, which I don't know off the top of my head, mm -hmm. but we would be able to produce those numbers to you. Okay. Now, the thing is, is that, you know, we're talking about how much this thing costs to build. Now, how much is it going to cost to maintain? I mean, you're probably looking at three hundred or 400000 a year just in maintenance. And you'll have to hire new people because the staff will have to be expanded in order to keep up with it. Now, I just want to make sure if you'd start from the beginning and say where you're at, you can make it in a short presentation at your next meeting so the rest of us could know what you're, where you're at. Okay? okay? Yeah. And I like seeing someone come up here with their name on their shirt saying, I want to be involved in this process, mm -hmm. so don't take any of this as resistance. Mm -hmm. We have to answer your questions, and we're happy right. to do so. Okay. And I'm glad that you came up and asked that, because if you're asking it, there are other people other asking people the same question. Other people have the same question. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So we will do that, sir. Thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. Now, just a chance, but by aside, this is the first time I've been in this building since it was ever built. I've been paying taxes here now for 30 years, and honey, see what we got here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's pretty, isn't it? Right. Would anyone else like to speak? Okay, that concludes our public comment section. Board member reports. Does anyone have anything to share? I have a couple. Um, things for the board that I wanted to, it's not really executive session stuff. Um, so Mr. Riley and I discussed the administrators rotating when they come and do their presentations for us. It's time consuming for all of them to come every month and listen to all of this. <laughs> and so um, we'd like to figure out a system. So Mrs. Brzezanko, since you're the one who seems to be representing the admins this evening, and Mr. Markajan, I'm gonna put you two in charge. I'm, I'm here by delegating. <laughs> um, find out from your cohorts how they'd like to do that. Mr. Riley already said he's gonna put it on a, you know, an admin meeting agenda, but give us a plan, and I'm sure we're going to be totally okay with it. We don't want to waste your time. We know that your time is so important, and so um, let us know what works for you all, and we'll work on adopting it. Okay? And on the flip side, we have brought that up during our administrative meeting, and yes, you're correct in some of the statements that you've made. They also um, wanted to know this is kind of a new board overall than, than what it's been since even I ar arrived a few years ago. So they were, they were curious as to what or how this board might like to go. So your feedback also would be appreciated. I think it would be nice to look at the grade levels. Like I know the world I live in is kindergarten. So, you know, I know parents might like to come to a September board meeting and hear from you know maybe a kindergarten report now it may not even need to be like a building principal report but maybe you know they we share something from a grade level you know the end of the year for seniors when they're going to be great there's always something going on that's more relevant to a specific grade and then instead of just focusing on one building if we could put it into one you know and have you know i know everybody will be lining up to be the one to present at the meeting i'm sure but it, that would be kind of nice to hear too from, I think, a parent perspective. Um, but I love this idea. 
I think it's, we are very busy and school days are very long and board meetings are very, very, very long. And <laughs> I think it would be a nice reprieve. Yeah, I do too. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, right? We all yep. did Earth Day, we all did MLK yeah. Day. Yeah. Right. So if one of you or one of the staff or something, um, yeah, I'm completely okay if we maybe just even do a, I, I actually really just meant to delegate it to you all because I want to hear what's happening at the building and I want to hear the community to hear what's happening at the buildings positively. And so whatever manner that happens, I, I don't care. Whatever is comfortable for you all and, and works. Anything else about that? Allegedly, you guys all have these fancy degrees that are, you know, completely around the subject matter of explaining education to us. Right. And uh, I just want to make sure that we trust you with that. You know, yeah. I, I think you might know what you're doing, something like that. I don't know. But it, it goes a long way. You know, we, we've got to talk to all, all of you guys, and there, I, I've learned a lot. And I, I know even just talking with you about some of the, the different cores of, around people um, who may need more services or may be functioning so highly they need additional services. Um, and that was something I wasn't even aware of that, you know, GPS takes a huge role upon. And it, it's amazing the team that you guys have up there across the whole district in general. It'd be nice to trust kind of amending some of our processes that are antiquated, slow, and sluggish around more of a, a approach that you, you deem mm -hmm. more aerodynamic, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Okay, um, I want to mention the Geneva Middle School Choir Concert. I, it was my pleasure to attend that. And I was, I was in awe. For those of you that don't know, I was a music teacher. I did that. I had a thousand little singers on the stage and tried to get them all to, you know, keep their shoes on and, and do all the things. And I was so amazed. Mrs. Mathers um, regimented control, for lack of a better word, of these students. They, none of them even like looked sideways. They were like, we are doing this. And she had, I don't know how many, I didn't ask her because she was so busy, but right, however many students there are in the whole middle school, up here, all singing together. And I was just super impressed by them. And I just wanted to say that out loud for everybody to hear. The also thing I was impressed with um, that evening was Mr. Poland's relationship with the kids. I saw him at the concert and he enjoyed it as well and he was fist bumping kids and knew their names, right, spoke to them by name and I was very impressed with him in that environment. I wanted to thank him for that also in a public forum. Um, on a semi-personal note, I run the retired teachers, staff, um, luncheons every month for those of us that have worked and toiled for Geneva schools and have hung up our hats like Mr. Lilly's about to do and so if you're if you are, have a friend that's retired or you are retiring or will be soon let me know if you're interested in joining us um, for lunch we meet to keep sort of updated with what's happening with the schools they love me going because I've got all the dirt and so it's just a fun thing to get together if you want to do that let us know right Mr. Hayes Mr. Hayes comes every month. Um, that's all I have. Anything else for the good of the order? I don't really have a report, but um, I got to see the, uh, some of the auditions for percussion uh, that Ms. Brown had, had put on. Um, it was phenomenal to see, one, how many people were in the building, two, how absolutely nerve-wracking that entire process still is. And there were a few of us from the public invited to come uh, that had originally been on a drum line in varying years from, you know, the 90s, mid-2000s to whenever I graduated. And um, I, I was very impressed by the process. More so, I was impressed by the amount of, of kids that were there. Um, one takeaway is there was, there was a, uh, someone who actually audition for pit, which is you know bells, marimbas, xylophones, those type of orchestral instruments in the front. And uh, I thought she did very well. And I was notified that she had not been originally in the pipeline like like band from you know fourth to sixth grade on. She had just kind of picked it up and was like, hey, I'm gonna learn this. 
I, it, it was phenomenal to see the program reaping dividends, and I appreciate you, Ms. Brown, very much for that. And uh, it was awesome to be part of that process, and thanks for Gamba for the equipment that is immaculately maintained, I might say. That marimba is 14, 15 years old now, and I don't know if you've seen, seen an, a musical instrument that primarily is played by beating it with mallets, but usually they don't look too good 15 years <laughs> later. Uh, so thank you and Gamba very much for, for keeping that value. In, in the realm of our artists here. Thank you. Anything else? Um, I wanted to just make note of, I know that there were some concerns at graduation um, regarding recognizing students that had passed away. Um, as a board, I know, I feel like that we should maybe come up with something as a whole, because sadly this will most likely happen again um, as of how we're going to recognize students and something that we could um, you know that could be a policy of sort and upheld each time so each student or whatever the case may be based on what that family I know many families are very private about that and they may not want to have something along those lines or something done in memory of their child it would definitely be um, family led but I think as a board we need to come up with a plan as to what that might look like for our students that tragically leave us way too soon. Mr. Riley and I have had that very discussion. So I, I know- some plans are in the works to do a procedure, for example, um, if it's a student at GPS, you know, who's responsible for sort of maintaining that record? So that let's say it's a fourth grader. And so then what year would they have graduated and what would the family like now and then again someone's gonna have to follow up and revisit that family. Because again, I mean, a long, right, right. And, and there may be families that don't, don't want, want that. Yeah. And that's totally their choice. But I think as a district, we have a responsibility to reach out to those families of those students and see and, and get their feelings. And, and knowing full well that if it's something that's happened and when they were small, and even at that moment, they may not want anything. Mm -hmm. But when that child's graduation year approaches, they may very well want something. And I think we need to be cognizant of that as a board so that we can meet the needs of our families even once their children have left us way too soon. Yeah. And that's, for me, an important aspect of it, the follow-up piece. Yeah. Um, because grief changes. It does. It doesn't go away. I hate when people say you get over it or whatnot. Mm -hmm. That's not a thing. Um, but the grief changes. And so, for example, if it's a fourth grader, right, versus if it was a junior in high school about to graduate or see what I mean? And so um, we agreed that we want that as part of whatever we write up so that there's somebody, a person in charge. What happened, I think, this year, um, unfortunately, was just a miscommunication thing because nobody's in charge of things like this. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to be because no. we gotta pretend no. that we it doesn't happen. None of us happen. want to do it, but yeah. Right? We all wanna pretend that this doesn't happen and children live to be 97, but that's not the world we live in sometimes. And so somebody needs to step up and, and shoulder that burden of making sure that these families are taken care of throughout their time here in Geneva. So. Ms. Riley and I are working on it. Okay, awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. This is great. Anything else? Did you have anything to add to that? Okay. No, the other thing, I, and we have had conversations about that, and I've, I've shared some thoughts with um, Mrs. Markajan. I've shared some thoughts with Mr. King. Um, I, can, I can attest as a former building at high school principal um, mm -hmm. having to kind of address those situations. Um, in, in my previous district, what we decided, which May or may not be beneficial in any other approval in any other districts. We um, we kept track of it, and when the time was appropriate near graduation, our school counselors and administration we would reach out to the family, we would go to their houses um, about a month beforehand, and we would present them with a cap and gown, a diploma, and the such. And it was more so an opportunity for I would say a private ceremony. I guess yeah. they had the chance to have siblings, their grandparents, aunts, uncles but it allowed them to reflect. It allowed us to you know, honor the, the situation that was going on and for them to kind of share with us 
you know, what that meant to, in, a, in a private such situation as opposed to doing in a, in a public graduation. So right. um, there's some things we can certainly have conversations about and discussions about. And I would agree that every family maybe wants something different. Right. But at least from my experience, I think that private and that personal touch was I what I agree. truly was appreciated in my former district. I agree. I appreciate this because one of the things that we don't cover a lot in higher ed is when you lose your child, you are still a parent. You mm -hmm. are still their parent. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of milestones that you will always wonder what if. And getting rid of that what if offers a lot of dignity in remembering those people. So I appreciate the conversation around this. Thank you. Thank you all. OK. The board will hold an executive session to consider the appointment, employment, discipline, or compensation of a public employee, the investigation of charges or complaints against a public employee, conferences with an attorney for the public body concerning disputes, involving the public body that are, the, that are the subject of pending or imminent court action, and preparing for conducting or reviewing negotiations or bargaining sessions with public employees concerning their compensation or other terms and conditions of their employment. Good idea. I need a motion. So, so moved. moved. I'll second. Any discussion about that? We will not be returning to take further action after our meeting. Thank you all. Have a good night. Oh, roll, call. roll call. Mrs. Craig. Yes. Mrs. Milliken Dixon. Yes. Mrs. Ortiz. Yes. Yes. Mr. Pearson. Yes. And Mrs. Cybalson. Yes. 